and gentlemen, give Hawa a loud Lagos welcome. All right, let me take a seat. Uh, welcome to the second day of the GT Bank Masterclasses. I'm super excited for who I'm bringing up to the stage today. Uh, Dapper Dan. Can I get a round of applause for Dapper Dan? Who knows Dapper Dan? Yeah. So he's a hip hop legend in terms of creating uh, bespoke garments for all of your favorite rappers from back in the day. You guys remember uh, uh, Salt and Pepper? Can I get a hand clap for salt and pepper? <laughs> Heavy D and the fat boys and anyways, let me not get into that. He will explain everything and um, yeah, so let's bring him out. The legendary Dapper Dan. <laughs> today but not even on purpose look at his green white green can we get uh, a round of applause for his green white green <laughs> before I start I, I have to uh, read something and I, I know I was gonna get nervous and I <laughs> never write things down but if I'm home and I don't want my family to to miss nothing that I want to say you know so before I start there's uh, some great questions that they have and they are all connected to the root of the same tree that tree is here in Africa. I was born and raised in an African village, the most popular village in the world, a village that is known and talked about in every great city in the world for its contribution to culture. That culture comes from a seed here in Africa that was planted in America. The name of that village is Harlem. Harlem is the, Harlem is the blackest village in the world because every day, every night, even in our dreams, we are reminded of our blackness. That is what it's like being in a black village in the heart of a white country. That's why I blackenize fashion, and that's what I'm here to talk about today. I'm ready for questions. Okay, so two things you brought up. Harlem and blackenizing fashion. So let's talk about Harlem. Why was it so important for you to go into making clothes, especially that um, used? Well, what happened was we have like a dark side and a light side of culture. Mm. So you either, when you grow up poor like myself, you think about what your contribution to culture and to society is going to be. Well, so I had to make a choice, and that choice was to go into fashion. And when I opened up my store, I was surprised to find out that the major companies wouldn't sell to me. The major companies would yeah, not I sell to you. I could not get you. any, any the major Gucci's, companies the Louis that sold to people of color hmm. to sell to me. So what I had to do was to figure out a way that I could sell to people of color like myself without having to buy from the major brands. And um, I was in Africa, and um, I first came home to Africa in um, 1968, and I traveled all around Africa, and then I came back again in 1973. In 1973, when I was in uh, Mon uh, Monrovia, Liberia, I had um, a Fulani tailor. Make a me Fulani some, tailor from? Yes, make me some clothes. Uh -huh. and, and I always remembered that African tailors had this great skill. So I said, I decided to myself, I was downtown and I gave uh, one of my business cards to uh, a Senegalese who was selling trinkets on the street. And I told him if he knows any uh, African tailors to tell him to get in touch with me. So I started out with one Senegalese tailor, then two, then four, then eight, 
And eventually I was up to uh, 11 Senegalese tailors working at night, 12 working at day, and I was open 24 hours a day, 365 days, 10 years straight. That's a lot of work. That's a lot of open yeah. hours. You must have seen a lot. Um, let's talk about some of the more memorable events that have happened in the shop. Seeing as it was open for 24 hours, who are some of the more interesting celebrities that you dressed? Um, even some of the personalities within Harlem? Uh, well, because middle class people of color wouldn't shop with me. They would prefer to shop downtown mm. in the major brand stores. So I had to come up with ideas that would uh, make them gravitate back towards Harlem. So one day somebody came in the store and they had a Louis Vuitton bag. And everybody in the store got excited about this bag. Louis Vuitton, Gucci, and all the major brands was not making um, clothes at the time. Mm. So when I looked at that bag and I said, if everybody's excited about that, here's a way I can get them from stop going downtown. So I came up with the concept on how to take these symbols that were so popular with people of color and turn them into full outfits. So if somebody's happy with a little tiny pouch, imagine if they, I can make them walk around looking like luggage. <laughs> so, so I came up with a concept where I could print any logo all over the garment and that's what they were attracted to. Some of the, in the beginning, the only customers that I had were the, were the people who I grew up with. And I grew up like in the inner city in the poorest neighborhoods. So the customers that I had, that had the money were all gangsters. And so there was this gangster economy that gravitated first to the store. As a result of the gangsters coming, hip hop, the birth of hip hop was taking place. So the hip-hop artists at this time all wanted to be like the gangsters. Yes. So they would come in, and they couldn't come in the store until after the gangsters left. So they would congregate outside, and, you, you and they would come inside. You said you used to make them wait outside yeah, they when would the gangsters have to wait were outside. inside. They didn't have money like that. so Because they, <laughs> they were broke. They would have to wait outside <laughs> until the gangsters left, and they would come in and ask me, what did the gangsters get? Right. In Harlem at this time, gangsters controlled what fashion was. Okay. And, and that's because they had the most money. Now there's a shift. In the beginning, it was the gangsters who have the money, and rappers wanted to look like the gangsters. Now it's the rappers have the money, and the gangsters want to look like the rappers. So there's been a shift in the cultural landscape of how fashion works today. OK. Let's talk culture. So as a Harlemite, it seems like people from Harlem like really flashy, really colorful, and high-end brands. Nigerians are kind of like that too, aren't we? Legosians and ladies and their Louis Vuitton and their Fendi's and their Pradas. We like, we're quite ostentatious as a people, fashion-wise. Um, why do you think this is? Like, what is, what is with this black love of flashy, rich-looking, things that we probably can't afford, but find a way to afford anyways. What is that about us? Well, the reason I'm into fashion because of what it done for me. When I was growing up in Harlem, I had holes in my shoes. Yes. And in the beginning, I used to put newspaper in to cover the holes. So when I walked down the street, you know, my feet wouldn't touch the ground. Eventually, we got innovative and we started using linoleum, mm -hmm. you know? So as we grew up and we get started to get money in the street, we found the beauty of clothes is how it tra transforms you, makes you feel like somebody. So if you got on a really rich outfit and you're downtown, no matter who, what people you're around, for that moment, with that outfit, you are important to anybody who's around you. So clothing became very transformative for us. It's the first thing. It was like, before clothing, it was like probably church. You go to church on Sunday and you jump up and you jump down and you stomp and you feel the Holy Ghost well dressing became the new Holy Ghost that's that, <laughs> that feeling you get <laughs> when you shop you know yes. right right okay so let's jump a little bit 
further into your career. Yeah. You've been designing these clothes for these hip hop artists. Everyone knows your brand in that you, you see the monochrome and you see it everywhere and you know that it's not from these actual Louis Vuitton, Fendi's, Gucci's. So in 1992, um, you were sued by Louis Vuitton Fendi, okay. or Gucci. You were, there okay. was a lawsuit that came up and they raided your stores. So tell us about that. First, we have to, we have to talk about what led up to that. And then okay. we have to talk about African-American culture. Just for a minute, we have to spread out on that. Sure. What is the nature of African-American culture? The nature of African-American culture, we were denied our culture when we arrived as slaves. So we are constantly creating new concepts in culture. Mm. So when you look at our past, rock and roll, calypso, Afro-Cuban jazz, mm. we, all, we always came out with these cultural platforms. And it's from these cultural platforms that spread around the world, but we never benefited from. So with, at the same time that I was opening my store, it was the birth of hip hop. So it was the first time ever that we had a cultural platform that we can operate on, that we can make money globally. Okay. All right, so I knew I needed to interpret that have an interpretation of that culture. So in the interpretation of the culture, we wanted to be sharp, we wanted to be fly. So hip hop artists was coming into this new thing. So I created, I say, well, hip hop always talks about being rich, being right. glamorous. Right. So I had to take elements of luxury brands and design it so that it fit hip hop. Right. So as I designed it to fit hip hop, it got really popular and they weren't paying me any attention. For like maybe the first seven or eight years that I was open, nobody even paid attention to it. And then Mike Tyson had a fight in the store. All right. And then the whole world became conscious of the fact, oh, this is where this is coming from. So that Tyson jacket was kind of what started that. Yeah, yeah, it was, yeah, the Mike Tyson fight. It, it took my popularity global because everybody wanted to know, well, who was Dapper Dan and what was he doing? Mm. So as a result, but still we didn't have social media. So the majority of the people of color in the world didn't even know that I was making these outfits that the gangsters and the hip hop artists were making. And uh, so there was a star um, athlete, Diane Dixon, she was a gold medalist and I made her this elaborate jacket. So Wait. he's talking about the big puff sleeve yes. jacket that has yes. been synonymous with his creations. It's the Louis Vuitton yes. puff sleeve jacket that was recreated a couple of years later, but we're going to get into that. So go ahead. Yeah. So what happened was, I, th I think in, in 2000, we have a magazine when Tom Ford, Mark Jacobs, and all the brands start replicating what I was doing earlier, but it didn't come into the attention of globally until social media Picked kicked in. And that's, that's when it became conscious. I think Beyonce wore it and it was on the runway and then everybody began in black Twitter in the United States. They knew that Dapper Dan made it. Mm -hmm. So that's when black Twitter kicked in and the whole... So that's, that's what I wanted to get into. Um, when they were raiding your stores for using their fabrics, uh, leathers, to create something that was originally your own, you got in trouble for it. Jump two years later, we see it on the runway. They have literally recreated what you got in trouble for and put it on their runways, claiming it as their creation. I wanted to ask, like, how did that make you feel initially? The first time you heard, like, oh my goodness, that's a Dapper Dan knockoff on the uh, Gucci runway. How did that make you feel? And oh. what did you do about it? Okay, first of all, I didn't make knockoffs. I made knockups. Right. Knock no, they knocked you off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a knockoff is when you copy something somebody does. A knockup when you take what they did and make it better. Right. So right. all I did was knockups. Knock I like that. All right. But they now, knocked you off then. <laughs> yeah. So um, actually, how did I feel? Well, we were we were used to this in the United States. Like I mentioned, all mm. the musical genres that we have created since. African Americans have been in, in America. We keep coming out with music, 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 music. All this cultural attributes that we send around the world, we just, nobody was ever conscious of it. Right. They would get it, 
and they would make a profit off it. It's just that social media created this global consciousness to what we want to know where it came from. And when it came from us, that's when it became popular. And then this is the first time we have ever had the opportunity to take advantage of it. So we're going to get into the discussion about cultural appropriation in a little bit, but I still want to take it back to um, the lawsuit, the fallout from that, and your current partnership with Gucci, because it all comes full circle. They sue him, and then they go into partnership with him years after when they realize that they've knocked off something from him. And yeah. um, let's talk about that partnership that you have now with Gucci. With Gucci? Well, I want to be uh, perfectly honest about this situation. Mm. I was apprehensive in the beginning, mm. and I thought about it until I got to meet Marco Bazzari, the CEO of Gucci, and Alexandro Michel, and I found out they were genuine in what they said. Okay. And I said, okay, well, if what you were doing was paying homage to me, then I can understand it. And how they made that clear, they said, when entering this partnership with me, they said, referring to Mark Jacobs mm -hmm. and, and, and the rest of the designers, they said, everyone paid, all the European designers paid homage to Dapper Dan, but nobody paid him. Ooh, so what we're good. gonna do with you is we're gonna enter into a partnership with you and we're gonna make sure that you get paid. That's awesome. So you have a store in Harlem? Yeah. So as a result of that, we have a, a, a collection, Gucci and, and, and I, a partnership on a collection that's in every Gucci store around the world. And then in Harlem, like I did in the beginning, everything that I make there under the Gucci label, under the Gucci and Dapper Dan label, is only made there in Harlem. So what you see like Beyonce and, and DJ Cali in, and all the stars, and Jay-Z in, all that is made directly in Harlem. You know, some of the stars, if they can't get to me, then they might buy from the collection that's in these other stores around the world. That's great, that's really great. Okay, so is that where we can get some of these cool Gucci specs in the belt? Is that yeah, part of the gotta, collaboration? One you thing guys? is, you have to be true to your brand. If you are partnership in a brand, and you're not wearing the brand, then something is wrong. Which, and that leads me to uh, what, what, what happens in, the, in Harlem. Like, you know, this is the cheapest jacket that I have in the store is $2,700. And the people in my community, they grow, a lot of them is like, grew up like I do. So every day you can meet me on the sidewalk outside and I'm interacting with the people in my community. The purpose of me having a store with jackets for $2,700 at the cheapest is so that those of us who have the money can spend that money in Harlem as opposed to going anywhere else. However, I'm still there to welcome the community, to interact with the community every day. Great. All right, so I, I know there are quite a few designers in the audience. Um, now we're asking for some advice. Having been through what you've been through in the fashion cycle, been at the very highs, you know, come to the very lows, what kind of advice can you give to some designers, any designers who are going through a hard time and actually feel like, mm, this might not be working out? I'm, I'm guessing you might have been there once or twice yourself. What? Okay, what's this is what advice? I did. From the time that they closed me up, that's when you see a, a proliferation of black designers coming on the set. Today, the most important thing you should do is find out why all those early black brands failed so that you don't repeat what they did. That's one. The other thing is to stay on top of fashion technology to get as far ahead of that as you can. Because what I did and what I was able to do to develop a niche is to create an idea that they hadn't thought of before. I started textile printing on leather, which nobody else was doing. So I developed a niche. Now, on top of that, you have to realize that there are two staircases in, fa in fashion. There's a European staircase with a glass ceiling. And then there's a black staircase that has no ceiling. 
So if you want to go up that staircase, you can rise to the top because you are catering to the people who are part of your culture. But if you want to go rise up to the other staircase, you have to navigate in a way that is all unfamiliar to you. Case in point, if you really want to know what that's like, you can read about the story of Naomi Campbell and Andre Leon Talley and see what it's like for our king and our queen who have embraced that staircase. Both staircases are important, but you have to decide which staircase that you want to climb up. Okay, so you were talking about the old school hip hop brands that are no longer around. The Sean Johns, the Fat Farms, the FUBUs. All of those were really, really important um, staples of fashion, especially within the hip hop generation in the 90s. They all don't exist. What happened? And how can we avoid such uh, situations um, with our brands? I think the, the most critical mistake they made when I started out, I showed that we could do all the European brands better than the Europeans brand was doing. With Sean John and the rest of the brand, but Puff Daddy did try to take it upstairs, mm. like with the Manx and the suits. He tried to give it a different look, but what happened with hip hop fashion, which when they started categorizing what I started out doing as street fashion, they took it to a different level. So what happens is that they catered to the lower end of fashion. They want to make, make it popular for everyone. But we have to scale it. We have to have something for those who want things upstairs and something to want things for downstairs. So what they did, what they focused on was just one level of fashion. And that's why all the houses collapsed. And then they were all doing the same thing. Mm. The, the most, and then as all these brands collapsed, the same identical things that we were doing, the way we were creating brands, the, bit, the major brands put in, we started with the sneakers and the jeans and the sport look. The major brands stepped in and sold the same items, but 800, 900, sneakers, mm -hmm. everything, the same items, the same concept now was being sold for three times and four times the money. And that's what we're buying today. We're, what we're buying today when we buy luxury brands is the concept that we started out with and we gave to them. That's very ironic. Um, let's talk about cultural appropriation. There is a difference between cultural appropriation and cultural exchange. Cultural appropriation is a big topic of discussion within the fashion and art worlds in that it seems that internationally people take um, What's it called? They take inspiration from the way we dress. And I'm talking black people, African, people of African descent. The way we dress, the way we present ourselves, the way we dance. But it doesn't necessarily come back to benefit us in that credit isn't given. And just like you said, the concept gets marketed and sold at a much higher price that even we can't access. So what is the difference between cultural appropriation and cultural exchange, and why is it important today? Well, it's simple because cultural appropriation is when you don't get no money for your creative input. Cultural exchange is when you're allowed to make money, like what the deal I have with Gucci. So it's no problem with that. Pablo Picasso, when he uh, came to Africa in 1906, that was cultural appropriation, but anybody, nobody made money, any money here from what his concept of what he developed in 1906 to 1919 or to 1909 when he came to Africa and did all these important Masks. works. No Africans benefited from that. So... If, if, if what we're doing today is cultural appropriation, then what Pablo Picasso did was cultural appropriation. But it's cultural exchange is different. We have to be involved in the profit that results from our creative juices. And as Nigerians, how do we uh, step ahead of that? How do you make sure that you're getting the credit 
for exactly what you put out um, in terms of your ideas and your silhouettes? How do you make sure that they give you your, your credit? Social media. Social ah. media is what made the brands conscious of uh, what's going on. So it's not by accident that after Gucci, you know, bear witness to that everything they was doing was the concept and idea of Dapper Dan. And then Louis Vuitton went out and got Virgil Abloh. That wasn't no accident. Because if it was an accident, they would already had, if it was on purpose, they would have already had stuff ready for the runway. But they knew that people of color are determining culture in the world today. You know, it's obvious. Even yeah. Just recently, Ralph Lauren just signed on to a street brand. So it's a shift. It's a cultural shift. And they're conscious of that. So now we don't have to worry about that. All we have to do is stay alert on social media so that this doesn't happen again. Social media is key. Interesting. All right. So you brought up Virgil, which is quite timely. Uh, Virgil Abloh, he was appointed creative director of Louis Vuitton. Uh, he is also quite special to us in that he is from the continent. He's Ghanaian. And um, he's one of the first black men in this position to be the creative director of such a high-end European brand. What do you see could be the positive trickle-down effect he could have on the industry? And how can we as Nigerians position ourselves to leverage from that trickle-down effect that will, I mean, well, Virgil Abloh happen. is very, very yeah. important to the generation that he represents. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I'm happy he is where he is. And I just hope that young people look at his trajectory. Virgil Abloh was the stylist for Kanye. So when you look at the relationship between fashion and music, it's, you can always trace it back to that. So that gave him the platform. And I think, like, what's happening here? One of the reasons I came here now to take a close look at Afro pop. Afro pop, I think, is a great platform for people in Africa to use as a vehicle to create other avenues for revenue, especially fashion. Yeah. And we have our own pop stars who are doing that. Um, we have the likes of Wizkid, who has gone into partnership with Nike. And uh, I think he's doing some work with Machino as well. We are trying to leverage it, but there's only few pop stars that cross over in such a large, um, so fast. So how can the ones that don't really make it to the international scene, Well, how but, can they leverage that? Well, it's, it all depends on the people. If you embrace your stars and you give them enough back, backing, then they can reach levels where they can be, become uh, brand ambassadors. But if they don't have the following of the people, then they can't become brand ambassadors. As simple as that, you know? But the, uh, the rappers, they have an obligation to be talking about things that's going to build on the culture, not just anything. Uh, we have rappers today that there's a cultural shift, and they're talking more about positive things. I think that rappers who are talking about positive things those need to be our brand ambassadors. I did a speaking engagement with, with um, Chance the Rapper in Chicago, and that took place like 10 o'clock in the morning, and he had like 3,000 people that attended, young people, and he marched them all to the polls to register to vote. Oh, so nice. when we get rappers who can do things like that, we need to support them. We need to make sure that their message goes global. So who are your, uh, some of your favorite rappers or music influencers, even fashion, uh, fashion streetwear brands? What are some of your favorites? Oh, my favorite rappers are always the ones, there's a dark side of the culture and then there's a light side of the culture. If you want to know the difference, the dark side of the culture talks about, it's misogynist, it emphasizes drugs, and any, any rapper, I don't care how, powerful his lyrics are. If he's talking about that, he can't be my favorite rapper. You know, I like Kendrick Lamar, I like Chance the Rapper, I like all the rappers who can build on the culture. So what's next for Dapper Dan? We've got this partnership with Gucci. 
Uh, what's where are you going from from here? Well, um, I was born and raised in Harlem. Right. I grew up swimming in the Harlem River, very poor, and I talk about my whole journey. I have a book coming out. Random House Book Company bought the rights to my story. That'll be out July second of next year. Sony Pictures bought the movie rights to my story, and that's coming out the year after that. Nice. That's great. So maybe we should open up the floor for some questions. What do you guys say? Yeah, questions. Can we get a mic out in the audience, please? Yeah. Hi, my name is Emanuela. My question is, whenever you, you ask someone, um, how do I promote my business, my brand? Hey, love. Sorry, one thing. Can you tell us your name? Yeah, I said my Okay, said second, can you speak a little louder? We can't, you know, the... Acoustics. My name is Emanuela. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question is, whenever you ask anybody, how do I promote my brand? They'll be like, through networking. So I want to ask, what are the rules and guidelines to a good networking? I didn't have the question. Can you repeat her question? Will you repeat the question? Or you, or you want Did me you to repeat it? it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So she, she was asking how to market her brand, the do's and don'ts of, girl, do it one more time. I'm not, <laughs> let me get you verbatim. <laughs> okay. So I don't summarize. Whenever you ask someone. Yes. Okay. How you can promote a brand. Right. They'll, they'll tell you to go, they'll tell you to network. Yes. So I want to ask, what are the rules and guidelines to a good networking? Gotcha. So she wants to know the rules and guidelines to networking. Because whenever she asks people like how to get her brand out, they say it's through networking. So she wants to know like what are the do's and the don'ts of networking and getting yourself out there. Okay, let me tell you how I did it. Um, designers have two approaches, right? Whatever the product is that you're creating, you start with an immediate circle. And um, that circle, just keeps expanding. But the difference between what I did and what you might hear other designers do is I always collaborated with the, with the end product, with the people I'm going to be dealing with. So my fashion concept was that people in Harlem, people of color, they would come to me and express their ideas. And then I interpret their ideas. And because of that, they would tell other people and other people until when you get enough in that circle, that circle be able to expand, then you go on the internet. I, whatever you put on internet today, somebody will put it on there the day after. However, if you impress someone today with something that you make that has more power than just putting a design on the internet. Good afternoon, sir. Hey, my name is, how are you doing? I'm fine. Great. My cool. name is Uche. Just a little bit louder, Uche. My name is Uche. There we go. <laughs> okay, so I think I have two questions. Locally in Nigeria or in Lagos, if you see a lady dress, we tend to make this statement that, oh, she's putting on a statement or she's, her fashion is making a statement. Now we want to know what makes an outfit a statement? Is it because she's going on or putting on brands from Gucci, from international brands, she's wearing the outfits and it's expensive? Is that what makes her outfit a statement? Could it be that there are some local, um, even locally, local designers in-house in the country or in the state that when she wears her outfit, she could also be making a statement from those brands? And two, I like the fact that you said we could move up the stairs if we decide to go using the European staircase or the local ones, whichever we decide to choose. If we go the European staircase, we need to have a hard time finding our way through because it's not a familiar route. If we go the local staircase, it's a familiar ground we could always climb up faster. What would you advise, which would you advise we go for? If we go for the local staircase in Nigeria or in Lagos, Babe, how would we Sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but 
I can barely keep up with your question. So let's go back to the first one okay. so that we, we don't forget it. And okay. then we'll deal with the second one, right? Okay, so the first, so, yeah, the first can you hear you, me? Did you hear the first no, question? No, I didn't hear. Can you hear me? Just say. Yeah, we can, can hear you. you. Can you hear just, me? I you lost just tell track, me what man. the first part was. Paying attention. All right, just summarize the question, the first, the first one. one, yes. If you see someone wearing an Oh, outfit, the statement, okay, okay. What so, makes that outfit a statement? Okay, sorry to cut you. So she's asking about making a statement with your outfit. What makes your outfit make a statement? Is it the way you wear it? Is it the designer clothes that you're wearing with it? Is it the local brands? Like what exactly is a statement about a statement outfit? Excellent question. And let me tell you what I did. I was Dapper Dan before I opened Dapper Dan's. So I impressed the media people in, in my area and they was impressed with the way I dressed because I always dressed as well. So I generated that excitement. If you generate excitement around yourself, then when you go to open up a store or have a brand, then that brand continues with that excitement. So let me tell you what happened to me. All right? When all the rappers, I want you to pay close attention to it. When all the rappers was coming to the store because I had this new idea, all, my, all the rappers used to wear my clothes on MTV. All right? And so I was getting all this publicity. Ted Demi, who was the director of MTV at the time, used to say, Dap, anytime you want us to come to the store, we'll come to the store. So what was the vehicle? The vehicle is the popularity, that, the excitement that you generate behind what you do. So the rappers was excited about the stuff I was generating. So I was on, all of them was wearing my stuff on your MTV. Once the, the designers, the, the brands found out that I was generating all this excitement and they wanted to step in and take over, the first thing they did was they went to MTV and told MTV, if you show anything that Dapper Dan made on MTV, then we won't advertise on it. Now, if you notice today, you'll see rappers and people today and you'll see a blur. Were you the so, reason for the origination of the yeah, blur I'm on the MTV? Yeah, I'm the originator of the blur. <laughs> so they wow, wanted to right. completely erase me. There's so many people in this out here are still unaware of the fact that I'm the originator of what's known today as Logomania. Look at the brands today. Every time you see the brands today and you see the logos all over the brand, that's Logomania. The curator of the Museum of Modern Art called me the most significant person in logos of the 20th century because that's when I started. So you, you got to see how you generate excitement. We are an exciting people. You got to be conscious of the fact that we constantly create culture and we have to know how to export that culture to our benefit. So you generate excitement. The concept, the, the, the perception that stylists and, and people who create fashion, they want you to think that there's something called ugly. There is no ugly. It's all generated by the excitement that a person puts behind something that, that determines whether it's ugly or not ugly. There's no ugly. All right. So create some excitement. Babe, we got to get to, uh, is that you? We have to get to other people's questions. Sorry. Maybe we'll get back to you. All right. Let's pass that microphone around. Mr. Guy in the white shirt. Hello. Hello. Epidem. Good evening. Good evening. I, I'm so excited about this program. Why? Uh, thank you. Okay, my name is Ivy. I just wanted to say thank you so much, Dr. Dan, for this opportunity. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask, how do you work with tailors? Um, you said earlier on that you have to employ tailors. <laughs> He's asking an amazing question. Yeah. No, go ahead. I'm listening. I'm listening. Okay. You said earlier on you had to get tailors at the beginning from Senegal, from um, where again? I'm trying, Senegal. So I wanted to know, how do you work with tailors to keep up with time, to keep up with details? How do you work with tailors? Thank you. So how do you work with your tailors to keep up with time and deadlines? You know, tailors are a little bit notorious in Nigeria for like falling hand or letting people down, you know? You got a big wedding to go to the next day. They come and the one arm is like this, or they don't pick up their phones at all. <laughs> dealing, with, dealing with tailors can be a headache. So he's asking like, how do you deal with your tailors, especially since yours were 
Senegalese and to, to motivate them to keep on time and to do good work. I'm going to tell you a secret, and I can say this here because I'm in Africa. I surrounded myself with all first immigration Africans who had a strong work ethic, right? And I would teach, I, I would, because you know, Africans didn't know how to work with leather. So I had to teach them how to work with leather because we work with a lot of leather. And I was doing furs and we worked with a lot of furs. So I would guide, I taught the first two and the first two taught the second two until we got up to 23. So everybody knew what the assignment was. But now I did have a problem. <laughs> and um, <laughs> it's a problem that the colonialists knew how to do better than me because I had all Senegalese tailors, right? Mm. And all of them was Wolof. So when somebody would make a mistake, nobody would tell. Uh. And I said, who did this? <laughs> they wouldn't tell because, you know, they don't want to. They don't want to out there. Yeah, they don't want to. Yeah, There's they don't no snitching. So no I, snitching. I did have a big issue with that, right? So one day they, they made me angry about that because I had all, I was dealing with gangsters, I was dealing with entertainment. They always want their stuff yesterday. Mm. All right? Always. Gangsters and entertainment. entertainment Scary if you stuff. don't deliver. So what I had to do, I lined all 23 of them up and fired everybody. Fired all 23 of them. Right? Then two days later, they start drifting back in. They were begging. They, they start drifting back in. And then now I got somebody who's going to tell me who is the one that did it. So, and, and then you know, it goes back to the, you know, the colonial times. Like if we slaves and, 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 and we on the plantation, nobody want to tell the master what happened mm -hmm. if something go wrong. So uh, now I use, like, I have a wall of, I have wall of tailors. I have uh, Fulani tailors. Uh, they ain't all that loyal to each other now. <laughs> you know, so it's a different thing now. But yeah, it's a big problem. You know what I mean? But you have to have people who are committed. But more than being committed, you have to have people who have a, a strong work ethic. Can we get the mic towards the front? Yeah, there you go. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good gentlemen. evening. My name is Olani. Olani. All right, Olani. Okay. Um, my question is, how do you build a luxury brand? Okay. What is that? How do you build a luxury brand? How do you build a luxury brand? Mm hmm Well, you would have today. You'd have to latch on to someone who's exciting. It all goes back to excitement. If you can't generate excitement, you're not going to build no brand. It's not, you know, I mean, they go out, the, the, the major brands today, the they get Beyonce, they get, they get exciting people, you know? It's not, they don't necessarily have the best style. They, in fact, all of them is making, making basically the same thing. You have to generate excitement. If you can generate excitement behind your brand, then you can make it. Today, I want you to look, pay close attention to the, the stars that you see wearing my things today. They have these big, lo big logos, say Dapper Dan, on the back. This is not something that they would normally wear. The reason they have that big Dapper Dan is because there's a story there. There's excitement there. And they want to identify with that story and that excitement because they know what that journey was about. You know? So it gets past just a garment. You know? It becomes a legacy. It becomes a story. It becomes something that they want to buy into. And, and that's how you build a brand. Good evening. My name is Victoria. So there was something I said yesterday and today, which is whatever you do when starting out or building your brand, get people that keep you grounded and stay true to your local identity. And whenever that is being said, my mind just goes to print and colors because I know we Africans, we like our loud. I mean, we like swinging music and loud colors. And to me, staying true to my local identity just means print to me. I'm sure there are other things you can use to stay true to your identity, but nothing else comes to mind. I don't know if you can point out a couple of things. And the second one is... Only one question. Sorry, love. We don't, okay. So that we can pass it around. 
All right. How do you stay true to your identity? I'm sorry? How do you stay true to your identity? I don't Other know. Than In my having... opening speech, right? This is a question that I became conscious of from coming to Africa and going back. How do I stay true to my identity? Every morning, every morning I wake up, no matter where I go, I'm conscious of the fact that I'm black. Do you know what that means? I ask my Nigerian friends and my African friends, when you wake up in the morning, do you think about you're black? Every day in America, I thought about the fact that I'm black. I'm constantly, you know, once you get out of bed, when you go to sleep, your dreams are about your interactions with society. And that interaction in society, even if you have really good, I have really good white friends, you know, and friends of uh, other ethnic groups, but none of that takes away from the fact that I'm constantly encountering things that make me conscious of my blackness. Now, there's only two ways to escape that. You embrace it and you build on it, or you suppress it and you use drugs. And I'm not going to use no drugs. I'm going to stay black and stay strong. Good evening. My name is Wumi Marshall. I wanted to find out about your sizing uh, for your garments. Um, in Nigeria, we have issues with our sizing. We have American size, we have the U U um, R British size or UK size, and it never fits because um, it's either the, bo the boobs are too big or the, the bum is too big. So it's always in between. And people keep saying, I'm a size. 12 up and a 14 down or vice versa. So it's always very complicated with the sizing. So um, what's your advice for us? I am try as in, I need to know how we can do the sizing right for Africa. Thank you. <laughs> how, how do you get that sizing right? You know, we have issues, uh, you know, we, maybe we're a little more plump at the bottom or up top. And yeah. the sizing isn't the same. And With then there's the sizing. European sizing, there's American sizing. Now, well, if you're talking about, like, production clothes, that's one thing. That's, that's, that's something I don't have to deal with. Now that I have a collection with Gucci, you know, we deal with it. But everything I made was made to order. But there's two ways I approach that. One way I approach that is, like, when you measure someone's body, that determines what their body is like, that their measurement's like. But that's my second, that's the second approach I have. The first approach I do is I say, bring me something you like the way it fits because that's how you like the way your clothes. So on a personal level, that's how I approach it, the way you like the way your clothes. But I always remind customers who come in and show me a picture, remember, everything on your mind might not look good on your behind, so don't come back telling me. <laughs> All right, so we have, okay, let's take one here and then let's get the lady in the green dress. Hello, um, there was a thing that stuck to me in the beginning of your speak and it was the transformative power of fashion and that made me think about another thing you might have experienced in New York in those years, that is uh, the concept of realness in drag queen culture. So as for black people in Harlem, dressing up was, you know, in a way, uh, getting accept downtown. Uh, do you see any parallels between that and the concept of realness in drag queen ballroom? That's not like a good question. Repeat what he said. Oh, bro, you might have to repeat oh, that. Sorry, okay. and just say it a little louder. So, um, no, uh, I was talking about you saying uh, that fashion has a transformative power and if there's any parallels between that transformative power for like people in Harlem dressing fancy to go downtown and uh, the concept of realness in drag queen culture that you may have experienced in, in like 80s New York as oh, well. Oh, did, did you say regalness in drag? The realness. Realness the, yes. in, in drag queen? In, in drag queen culture. In drag yes. queen culture. So, who so, man. <laughs> oh, y'all, don't laugh at me, please. <laughs> so, um, the 
sense of regalness in drag queen culture. Realness, not regalness. Sorry, realness. Real. I can't hear. My hearing is okay. And then the um, the paradox of wanting to dress up to be accepted. Now I'm completely butchering it. Man. Let me give you a general answer. Maybe maybe this will tell you something. Let me tell you about who Holomites are, who we are. All right. Now this is, we gotta go. Do, we gotta do a little history here. When you look at the slave trade, right? When they put us on the slave block, and they put a, we had to survive that. When they put us on the ship for the, the passing, we had to survive that. When we was on the plantation for 300 years, we had to survive, su survive that. Then you find all this, all this process are producing strong black people. Because only the strongest ones were able to make that middle passage and only the strongest ones was able to survive slavery and only the strongest ones said that they wasn't tolerating that and came up north and only the strongest ones that settled in Harlem and said we wasn't going back we had to, and that's what I am the first generation of that of those so we had a strong sense of who we are and so that's what gave us the pride and this, this, this concept about that creativity that we had. So I hope that answers your question. Okay. Hello, good afternoon, Dr. Dan. I'm Belkis and I'm from Brooklyn. I'm glad to meet you here in Nigeria. Um, my question for you is if you can talk to us a little bit about maybe some of the uh, social programs or activities in which you're involved, because throughout your speech today, you've spoken a lot about community, economic empowerment, development, and creativity. So I wonder how that manifests in your social activities in the community in New York City. Thank you. Can you repeat the question? Your social activities that you're involved in in New York City? And what, what social programs? Mm -hmm. Okay, let me tell you what my mission is. Um, I'm, I'm, everything that I've learned, I taught myself. Um, my father only went to the third grade, and my father emphasized to me the importance of reading. The first time my father heard me read, he thought tears came to his eyes because he only went to the third grade, right? So I'm basically, a, 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 in, in Harlem, a kid from the corner, right? And so my mission, the, like I tell kids in corner, the hardest graduation that they will ever have in their life is graduating from the corners. So my mission is to show them how to get off the corner like I got off the corner. And to, so everything that I do, fashion is just a platform for me to lay down information that will be important to get kids who grew up like I grew up, very poor and very angry on how to be successful. And that's what I do. Right now, I'm organizing rappers with positive messages. Like I told you, I was on a speaking engagement with Chance and uh, my adopted nephew, uh, uh, ASAP Ferg. We're spreading, a, I, I'm spreading messages that change the lyrics, you know, when you look at the lyrics on, on what a lot of young people are listening to, it's, it's holding us back from where we need to be. So that's my mission. My mission is to change things from the corner. We have, in America, we got great politicians, you know. We have great civic leaders, but we don't have anybody who could take the message to the corner. And that's my, that's my assignment. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to be mad, but we can't take any more questions. We are out of time. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for putting up with me not hearing stuff. And thank you, Dapper Dan. Thank Is there you, so any, much. you want to say any last words? Well, um, oh, I got to tell you why I'm in Nigeria. Nobody asked me why I'm in Nigeria. Why are you in Nigeria, Dapper Dan? I came to Nigeria, right? Um, years ago, when I was a teenager, Elijah Muhammad had this newspaper and in this newspaper the front cover was a black arm reaching out from Africa and another black arm reaching out from America and they clasped hands in the middle of the ocean. So I'm here, the first, my first stop and I asked her uh, to take me to was the museum and I bought $500 worth of books to study the symbolism 
that's in African culture because that's what we're missing. We're missing that symbolism. It's the symbols. You look at all of fashion, everything we're buying is based on Gucci symbol, Fendi symbol. We need symbols. We need to build our brand about symbols because the symbol can sell more than the gum. So I'm here to get African symbols and African culture so that I can bring it together. You know, that's my next platform, where I'm going from here. That's what I'm doing in Nigeria. I'm, I'm here to bring us together. Because we're not going to be respected globally until we produce things that people respect. We don't need to keep copying them. Now is the time. We already showed them. This platform Virgil and myself have today. Oh, we show we have the talent. Okay, now we need the symbols. We don't need to keep, you know, expanding on their symbols. We can create our own symbols, create our own magic. Magic started here, why we can't send it globally. And on that note, that concludes this session. Thank you all for coming. Y'all look so beautiful. Have an amazing time at the shows and take lots of photos. <laughs>